turn in your Bibles to the book of Philemon. And I want to share part two of the message that I introduced last week entitled, The Unthinkable Sin of Unforgiveness. Philemon, verse number eight. Stand with me in honor of the reading of God's word. Verse 8, the Bible says, Therefore, though I might be bold in Christ to command what is fitting, what is fitting, that you ought to believe, forgive a brother. Yet, for Christ's sake, or love's sake, I'd rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I believe the two things he says reminds us that he's lived long enough and he's been in trouble enough to know what it is to have to forgive someone. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains. Here's a young man that's been changed. God's turned his heart, and he needs Philemon's forgiveness. Who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him. That is my own heart. I, sending him back could not mean any more than if I sent my own heart. Whom I wish to keep with me that on your behalf he might minister to me and my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I will do nothing that you, your good deed might not be by compulsion, but as it were, free will or voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever. No longer is a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for who you are. Speak into our lives in this time together for Jesus' sake. Amen. You may be seated. One of our sweet ladies, Lisa Leathers, sent me a story the other day. When you start preaching on subjects, people have books or stories they want to share with you and they're always a blessing but it's a thought that was taken from the book leave your enemies in God's hands by Max Licato and I want you to listen to this story some years ago a Rottweiler attacked our golden retriever puppy at a kennel the worthless animal climbed out of its and into Molly's and nearly cured her he left her with dozens of gashes and a dangling ear. I wrote a letter to the dog's owner urging him to put the dog to sleep. But when I showed the letter to the kennel owner, she begged me to reconsider. What that dog did was horrible. But I'm still training him. I'm not finished with him yet. God could say the same about the Rottweiler who attacked you. What he did was unthinkable, unacceptable, inexcusable, but I'm not finished yet. Your enemies still figure into God's plan. Their pulse is proof. God hasn't given up on them. They may be out of God's will, but not out of his reach. You honor God when you see them as, not as his failures, but as his projects. God occupies the only seat on the Supreme Court of Heaven. He wears the robe and refuses to share the gavel. For this reason, Paul wrote, Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Revenge, he says, removes God from the equation. Vigilantes displace and replace God. I'm not sure you can handle this one, Lord. You may punish too little or too slowly. I'll take this matter into my own hands, thank you. And this is what you want to say. No one has a clearer sense of right or wrong than the perfect Son of God. Yet when he suffered, he didn't make any threats, but left everything to the one who judges fairly. Only God assesses accurate judgments. We impose ju punishments too slight or severe. God dispenses perfect justice. Vengeance is his job. Leave your enemies in God's hands. You're only endorsing their misbehavior when you do. You can hate what someone did without letting hatred consume you. Forgiveness is not excusing. 
nor is forgiveness pretending. David didn't gloss over or sidestep Saul's sin. He addressed it directly. He didn't avoid the issue, but he did avoid Saul. Do the same. Give grace. But if need be, keep your distance. You can forgive the abusive husband without living with him. Be quick to give mercy to the immoral pastor, but be slow to give him a pulpit. Society can dispense grace and prison terms at the same time. Offer the child molester a second chance, but keep him off the playgrounds. Forgiveness is not foolishness. Forgiveness is, at its core, choosing to see your offender with different eyes. You don't excuse him, endorse him, or embrace him. You just route thoughts about them through heaven. You see your enemy as God's child and revenge as God's job. By the way, how can we grace recipients do anything less? Dare we ask God for grace when we refuse to give it? This is a huge issue in Scripture. Jesus was tough on sinners who refused to forgive other sinners. In the final sum, we give grace because we've been given grace. Forgiveness brings breakthrough in your life. Lack of forgiveness brings breakdown. Unforgiveness locks you up in the past. In other words, failure to forgive will imprison believers in their past. They just can't move on. They can't get beyond that unforgiveness. Unforgiveness locks you up in the present. Today, I want to pick up and talk to you about unforgiveness locks you out of your potential. It's one thing to lock you up. It's one thing to lock you in, but it's another thing to lock you out. There's some things that God wants to do in our life. I told the story uh, last week or the week before last of one of our young men who forgave his stepfather and his stepmother for the abuse in their life, and little did he know the potential God had for him, how he would be preaching a message of forgiveness that would literally bring thousands to faith in Christ. But unforgiveness locks you out of your potential. You may never know all that God has for you because unforgiveness, don't miss this one-liner, blurs your, vi your vision to see God and his purpose clearly. So unforgiveness keeps the pain alive. It never allows the wound to heal. So dwelling on the wrong done feeds anger and resentment and robs one of the joy of living. See, unforgiveness is a major place for bitterness to grow, and it normally does. Listen to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. In Romans 12, 18, the Apostle Paul said, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. Now, did you hear that? If it is all possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all men. You can forgive someone even though there is not reconciliation. You have done your part. You cannot do the other person's part. So as much as is possible, you do your part to live peacefully with all people. Romans 14, 19, Paul said, Therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may build up or edify another. Here's what he's saying. Give peace a chase. As if in a hunt, it is pursuing, it is being eager, aggressive in forgiveness. That's a picture of what God does in the person of Jesus Christ in forgiving us. So he's telling us that harmonious living with other people is the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit of God in your life. I wrote a sermon and put it in the first book that I wrote entitled Beavers, fallen trees, and damned up lives. And in that, I talked about the spirit-filled life and how beavers come into a person's life. They come to your farm. And almost unbeknownst to you, I was at a farm the other day and saw this happen. Beavers begin to gnaw at the 
the bottom of a tree and before too long that tree gives way and falls across the waterway because the brook in the begin with you may not notice it the water goes around it the water goes over it but then he gets on the other side and he caused the tree to fall and then the joker begins to take weeds and straw and sticks and before too long he's dammed up the water the water in the Bible according to John chapter 7 is an, alle uh, an, an allegory of the spirit filled life he talks about those who are full of the Spirit of God will have like an artesian well in them. And this water is rising up in us. But yet the beavers come along and down the tree, trees and dam up our lives. And as a result, there's no flow there. And the Spirit-filled life is choked out of the believer. The Bible says that we're not only to pursue peace, but he says we're to pursue holiness. That means a pure, obedient, holy life that we live set apart for God's glory. And by the way, when the beavers of this life dam up our lives, there's only one thing that can set you free, and that is dynamite. You ask a farmer, what do you do when they dam up your brooks? Dynamite. And dynamite comes from a Greek word, dunamis, which speaks of the power of God. I don't know of nothing that can set a person free who has allowed bitterness to dam the wells of their heart other than the power of God. So he's called us to a pure, obedient, holy life. We live set apart for God's glory. And by the way, holiness is a deliberate choice to seek cleansing from daily defilement, to be set apart and to be different. And by the way, to be holy literally means to be different. And the Bible says, without which no one will see the Lord. Listen to this. Pursue peace and pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. The reference is to unbelievers who see and observe our pursuit of peace and holiness without which they would not be drawn to accept Christ themselves. When you and I choose not to forgive, we are so damned up that it keeps people from seeing the flow of God's spirit, God's love, God's joy, God's peace, and God's forgiveness through our lives. So they look at the church, but they don't see God in it. They don't see Christ in it. No wonder Paul in Galatians 4.19 was concerned for the church when he said, My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Christ is so formed in you that his life is fleshed out through you. You see, Christ's likeness is our greatest possible testimony to the world. Here's what he's asking us to do. He's saying, I'm calling you to take a careful look in that verse I read a moment ago in Hebrews 12 verse 15 the Bible says looking carefully it means see to it take the oversight of it lest anyone listen to this statement fall short of the grace of God fall short of the grace of God for us who have been saved by the grace of God there's the potential in that grace of God to provide us with every power every opportunity, every strength necessary to grow to full maturity in the Lord. And Paul, that's why Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. In other words, we'd be nothing if it were not for the grace of God. And so the grace of God desires to flow through our life that other people can see the marvelous traits of God's activity in our life. So here's what Paul's saying. Anything good in my life is due to the working of, of the grace of God. Now, wonder what does he mean when he says that you fail or fall short of the grace of God? To come short of, it means to fail to reach a goal. In other words, God's grace has a goal in your life. God really does have a purpose for your life. Wouldn't it be a tragedy to come to the end of life and look back over the years and see all kinds of missed opportunities? So here's the warning. Do not fail to be everything that grace can make you. It pictures a lagging behind in the race of life. And so pursue it. Go down the racetrack. Pursue peace. Pursue holiness. Be all that God wants you to be and allow grace to flow through you. And don't allow anything to dam up God's grace, God's spirit in your life. The Bible says not only have a careful look, but it warns us about a careless life. It says lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. You see... When a root of bitterness springs up, 
it renders us ineffective. He will use bitterness to take away your strength and to destroy your happiness and your joy. Bitterness has a way of poisoning all of your life. And by the way, the devil will tell you that you are justified in being bitter because of what you have done, what you had done to you. And the Bible, listen to this. The Bible says, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many may be defiled. If you don't deal with the root of your bitterness, later on you have to deal with the fruit that grows from your bitterness. When the Bible says many are defiled, it means the corruptive influence. I was flying recently. Have you ever done this? And I had one of those, uh, uh, any, I got a nice pen here. I had an inexpensive pen in my pocket. And I was writing my sermons. I had it in my pen, in my pocket. And I was going somewhere to preach and I had on a white shirt. And evidently at a certain elevation, I don't know if it was something with a cabin pressure or whatever, but I looked down and I had a big old black spot right here. My pen had started leaking. And the lady came by and said, don't you worry about it. Said, soda water will take it right out. And I said, man, get me some. She brought it and I started rubbing it in there. And sure enough, it got lighter. Now it's gray instead of black. My whole shirt. Now I've got this big old spot right there. <laughs> That's what bitterness does. It starts right here. And you think you can just rub it away instead of confess it and real deal with it before the Lord. What happened? It spreads and it has a corruptive influence and things even get worse. The word defy, defile is the same word in the Greek New Testament for the word die or stain. I wrote these statements. Unforgiveness leads to bitterness, which leads to a person's vision being blurred. Bitterness shuts off affection and kindness. Bitterness halts the flow of the fruit of the Spirit of God. There was no love, joy, or peace. Bitterness is not just a sin. It's an infection. It spreads. It is seen very clearly in a person's speech. They become cutting and sarcastic and even slanderous. Bitterness distorts a person's whole outlook on life. And this is a constant reminder to those who refuse to forgive will not enjoy forgiveness from God. Matthew 6, 14 and 15. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive them their trespasses, they trespassed against you, neither your Father in heaven forgive you. This is too high of a price to pay for the pleasure of enjoying the lack of forgiveness. One of the great joys of being a Christian, listen to this statement, is fellowship with other believers. However, unforgiveness causes us not to enjoy fellowship with others. You always have a facade on. You're never real. Nobody can ever look you in the eyes. All of your conversations are cold and calculated at best. The Bible teaches that unforgiveness is offensive to fellow believers. So unforgiveness is offensive to fellow believers. Matthew 18, 31. You can just make a note of it. So an unforgiving attitude will destroy a believer's relationship with other fellow believers. Let, let me just do this. Time is catching up with me again, but I've got time to do this. An unforgiving spirit locks you out of real, authentic worship. You can attend worship, but unforgiveness will not allow you to worship. Listen to what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5, 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and by the way, bringing a gift to the altar is an act of worship. Our giving is worship. And there you remember that your brother has something against you. Wait a minute. He didn't say you remember you got something against your brother. You remember your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there. Leave it there at the altar. And go your way, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. In Matthew 5, you want to make a note of this. In Matthew 5, 25, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 7, the Bible teaches that it is better for you to be wronged than to be the cause of dishonoring Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, 7, it's better that you be wrong than to be the cause. And by the way, is the reason Jesus died for my sins is because he was right to die for my sins? No. He took my wrong. No wonder when the, can you imagine those that mocked him and said, ah, he claims to be the son of God. If you're the son of God, come down off the cross. He could have come down off the cross and proved he was right. 
but he stayed there because we were wrong. Wow. So really in the Christian life, there are times that you're asked to forgive that people will make, it, make you think that you were the one that was wrong. If forgiveness locks me out of my potential, locks me out of my potential, unforgiveness does. Forgiveness unlocks the prison. See, whatever stood between you and the other person is removed as a prison door is open. This is God working, and if they will come, if they will come and meet you in that forgiveness, there's reconciliation. But I want to say something to you. Reconciliation is a totally different animal than forgiveness. Sometimes someone says, well, I asked them to forgive me, but they didn't, and so we didn't get anywhere. That is not a true statement. If you genuinely meant it, you have received God's forgiveness, and whether they offered or not, you've done what God requires you to do, and if they would come the rest of the way, it would be reconciliation. But they're not the same thing. That's another animal altogether. So the wall between you crumbles when there is reconciliation, and you embrace one another. But the wall on your side crumbles when you ask forgiveness. See, forgiveness should be given. Listen to this. Forgiveness should be given even if it's not sought. See, where'd you, where'd you get that from? Jesus is on the cross. He's dying for the sins of the world. And he speaks to his father and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They hadn't asked for it. They're murdering the son of God. And he's saying, Father, forgive them. Stephen is being stoned to death. They're hitting him with rocks. And Stephen is saying, forgive them, for they know not what they do. See, to forgive is to write in large letters across the debt, nothing owed. To forgive is to bundle up all the garbage and trash and dispose of it, leaving the house clean and fresh. To forgive is to sandblast a wall of graf graffiti, leaving it, looking like new. I wrote these statements down this morning, or not this morning, but last week when I prepared. Listen to the results of forgiveness. Don't you listen to this. Here it is, and I'll have to quit. When you forgive someone, wrath and anger is replaced by worship. It frees you up. If you have unforgiveness in your heart and you're in the service and you're kind of getting into the service and God's moving, you may even find yourself Lifting your hand, saying, you know, glory to God. By the time you get your hand up, the devil's the accuser of the brethren. He'll remind you you have no right to hand, have your hand up because there's so much bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. Now, he's a liar, but that doesn't mean that he, can, he doesn't have the capacity to at least speak truth. He gave Jesus Christ the word of God. That's truth. And so what happens, your hand comes down, you're back into your prison, but when you forgive, it's replaced by worship. Wrath is. Listen to this. When you forgive, jealousy is replaced by joy. You're not jealous or envious of anybody. You can rejoice with them. It's replaced by joy. Uh, listen to this. Lying is replaced by loving. Hatred, listen to this. Hatred is replaced by hunting for opportunities to bless. You're looking for ways to let them know that you really forgive and that you love them now. Listen to this. Genuineness is there to replace falsehood. Fear is replaced with peace. I mean, this goes on and on. This is just stuff I was just writing coming out of. And it's all because we decide to forgive. Well, the single greatest thing that's ever happened in my life is when I got forgiven by God. Can anybody else say, say that? I mean, I've never had anything greater to happen in my life than the day I received God's forgiveness. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, work mightily in our hearts this morning. Help us to realize how much we desperately need you. Thank you for the forgiveness of our Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, use this text, these truths, this story in the life of your people.